The Oval Portrait by Edgar Allan Poe The chateau under which my valet had ventured to make forcible entrance rather than permit me in my desperately wounded condition to pass a night in the open air was one of those piles of commingled gloom and grandeur which have so long frowned upon the Apennines, not less in the fact than in the fancy of Mrs. Radcliffe. To all appearance it had been temporary and very lately abandoned. We established ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuously furnished apartments. It lay in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry and bedecked with manifold and multiform armorial trophies, together with an unusually great number of very spirited modern paintings in frames of rich golden arabesque. In these paintings, which depended from the walls, not only in their main surfaces, but in very many nooks, which the bizarre architecture of the chateau rendered necessary. In these paintings, my incipient delirium, perhaps, had caused me to take deep interest, so that I bade Pedro to close the heavy shutters of the room, since it was already night, to light the tongues of the tall candelabrum which stood by the head of my bed, and to throw open far and wide the fringed curtains of black velvet which enveloped the bed itself. I wished all this done that I might resign myself, if not to sleep, at least alternately to the contemplation of these pictures, and the perusal of a small volume which had been found upon the pillow, and which purported to criticize and describe them. Long, long I read, and devoutly, devotedly I gazed. Rapidly and gloriously the hours flew by, and the deep midnight came. The position of the candelabrum displeased me, and outreaching my hand with difficulty rather than disturb my slumbering valet, I placed it so as to throw its rays more fully upon the book. But the action produced an effect altogether unanticipated. The rays of the numerous candles, for there were many, now fell within a niche of the room, which hitherto had been thrown into a deep shade by one of the bedposts. I thus saw in vivid light a picture all unnoticed before. It was a portrait of a young girl, just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at the painting hurriedly and then closed my eyes. Why I did this was not at first apparent, even to my own perception. But while my lids remained thus shut, I ran over in my mind my reason for so shutting them. It was an impulsive movement to gain time for thought, to make sure that my vision had not deceived me, to calm and subdue my fancy for a more sober, more certain gaze. In a very few moments, I again looked fixedly at the painting, That I now saw aright, I could not and would not doubt, for the first flashing of the candles upon the canvas had seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses and to startle me at once into waking life. The portrait, I have already said, was that of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders, done in what is technically termed a vignette manner, much in the style of the favorite heads of Sully the arms, the bosom, and even the ends of the radiant hair melted imperceptibly into the vague yet deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. The frame was oval, richly gilded, and filigreed in moresque. As a thing of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself, but it could have been neither the execution of the work nor the immortal beauty of the countenance which had so suddenly and so vehemently moved me. Least of all, could have been that my fancy, shaken from its half-slumber, had mistaken the head for that of a living person. I saw at once that the peculiarities of the design, of the vignetting, and of the frame must have instantly dispelled such an idea, must have prevented even its momentary entertainment. Thinking... Earnestly upon these points, I remained for an hour, perhaps half sitting, half reclining, 
with my vision riveted upon the portrait. At length, satisfied with the true secret of its effect, I fell back within the bed. I had found the spell of the picture in an absolute life-likeliness of expression, which, at first startling, finally confounded, subdued, and appalled me with deep and reverent awe. I replaced the candelabrum in its former position, the cause of my deep agitation being thus shut from view. I sought eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories, turning to the number which designated the oval portrait. I there read the vague and quaint words which follow. She was a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee, and evil was the hour when she saw and loved and wedded the painter. He, passionate, studious, austere, and having already a bride in his art, she, a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee, all light and smiles and frolicsome as the young fawn, loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette and brushes and other untoward instruments which deprived her of the countenance of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride. But she was humble and obedient, and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark high turret chamber, where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from hour to hour and from day to day, and he was a passionate and wild and moody man, who became lost in reveries, so that he would not see that the light which fell so ghastly in that lone turret withered the health and the spirits of his bride, who pined visibly to all but him. Yet she smiled on, and still on, uncomplainingly, because she saw the painter, who had a high renown, took a fervid and burning pleasure in his task, and wrought day and night to depict her who so loved him, yet who grew daily more dispirited and weak. And in sooth, some who beheld the portrait spoke of its resemblance in low words, as of a mighty marvel, and a proof not less of the power of the painter than of his deep love for her, whom he depicted so surpassingly well. But at length, as the labor drew nearer to its conclusion, there were admitted none into the turret, for the painter had grown wild with the ardor of his work, and turned his eyes from the canvas merely, even to regard the countenance of his wife. And he would not see that the tints which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her who sate beside him. And, when many weeks had passed, and but little remained to do, save one brush upon the mouth and one tint upon the eye, the spirit of the lady again flickered up as the flame within the socket of the lamp. And then the brush was given, and then the tint was placed. And, for one moment, the painter stood entranced before the work which he had wrought. But in the next, while yet he gazed, he grew tremulous and very pallid and aghast, and crying with a loud voice, This is indeed life itself, turned suddenly to regard his beloved. She was dead. Edgar Allan Poe Edgar Allan Poe, born January 19, 1809, died on October 7, 1849. He was an American writer, editor, and literary critic. Poe is best known for his poetry and short stories, particularly his tales of mystery and the macabre. He is widely regarded as a central figure of romanticism in the United States and American literature as a whole. And he was one of the country's earliest practitioners of the short story. Poe is generally considered the inventor of the detective fiction genre and is further credited with contributing to the emerging genre of science fiction. 
He was the first well-known American writer to try to earn a living through writing alone, resulting in a financially difficult life and career. Poe was born in Boston, the second child of two actors. His father abandoned the family in 1810, and his mother died the following year. Thus orphaned, the child was taken in by John and Francis Allen of Richmond, Virginia. They never formally adopted him, but Poe was with them well into his young adulthood. Tension developed later as John Allen and Edgar repeatedly clashed over debts, including those occurred by gambling and the cost of secondary education for the young man. Poe attended the University of Virginia for one semester, but left due to lack of money. Poe quarreled with Allen over the funds for his education and enlisted in the Army in 1827 under an assumed name. It was at this time that his publishing career began, albeit humbly, with the anonymous collection of poems, Tamerlane and Other Poems, 1827, credited only to a Bostonian. With the death of Francis Allen in 1829, Poe and Allen reached a temporary rapprochement. However, Poe later failed as an officer cadet at West Point, declaring a firm wish to be a poet and writer, and he ultimately parted ways with John Allen. Poe switched his focus to prose and spent the next several years working for literary journals and periodicals, becoming known for his own style of literary criticism. His work forced him to move among several cities, including Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York City. In Richmond in 1836, he married Virginia Clem, his 13-year-old cousin. In January 1845, Poe published his poem, The Raven, to instant success. His wife died of tuberculosis two years after its publication. For years, he had been planning to produce his own journal, the pen, later renamed the stylus, though he died before it could be produced. Poe died in Baltimore on October 7, 1849, at age 40. The cause of his death is unknown and has been variously attributed to alcohol, brain congestion, cholera, drugs, heart disease, rabies, suicide, tuberculosis, and other agents. Poe and his works influenced literature in the United States and around the world, as well as in specialized fields such as cosmology and cryptography. Poe and his work appear throughout popular culture in literature, music, films, and television. A number of his homes are dedicated museums today. The Mystery Writers of America present an annual award known as the Edgar Award for distinguished work in the mystery genre publishing career. After his brother's death, Poe began more earnest attempts to start his career as a writer. He chose a difficult time in American publishing to do so. He was the first well-known American to try to live by writing alone and was hampered by the lack of an international copyright law. Publishers often produced unauthorized copies of British works rather than paying for new work by Americans. The industry was also particularly hurt by the Panic of 1837. There was a booming growth in American periodicals around this time period, fueled in part by new technology, but many did not last beyond a few issues and publishers often refused to pay their writers or paid them much later than they promised. Throughout his attempts to live as a writer, Poe repeatedly had to resort to humiliating pleas for money and other assistance. After his early attempts at poetry, Poe had turned his attention to prose. He placed a few stories with a Philadelphia publication and began work on his only drama, Politician. The Baltimore Saturday Visitor awarded Poe a prize in October 1833 for a short story, M.S. Found in a Bottle. The story brought him to the attention of John P. Kennedy, a Baltimorean of considerable means. He helped Poe place some of his stories and introduced him to Thomas W. White, editor of the Southern Literary Messenger in Richmond. Poe became assistant editor of the periodical in August 1835, but was discharged within a few weeks for having been caught drunk by his boss. Returning to Baltimore, 
Poe obtained a license to marry his cousin, Virginia, on September 22, 1835. Though it is unknown if they were married at the time, he was 26 and she was 13. He was reinstated by White after promising good behavior and went back to Richmond with Virginia and her mother. He remained at the Messenger until January 1837. During this period, Poe claimed that its circulation increased from 700 to 3,500. He published several poems, book reviews, critiques, and stories in the paper. On May 16, 1836, he and Virginia Clem held a Presbyterian wedding ceremony at their Richmond boarding house, with a witness falsely attesting Clem's age as 21. The narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket was published and widely reviewed in 1838. In the summer of 1839, Poe became assistant editor of Burton's Gentleman's Magazine. He published numerous articles, stories, and reviews, enhancing his reputation as a trenchant critic, which he had established at the Southern Literary Messenger. Also, in 1839, the collection of Tales of the Grotesque and Arabesque was published in two volumes, though he made little money from it and it received mixed reviews. Poe left Burton's after about a year and found a position as assistant at Graham's Magazine. In June 1840, Poe published a prospectus announcing his intentions to start his own journal called The Stylus. Originally, Poe intended to call the journal The Pen, as it would have been based in Philadelphia. In the June 6, 1840 issue of Philadelphia's Saturday Evening Post, Poe bought advertising space for his prospectus, Prospectus of the Pen Magazine, a monthly literary journal to be edited and published in the city of Philadelphia by Edgar A. Poe. The journal was never published before Poe's death. Around this time, he attempted to secure a position with the Tyler administration, claiming that he was a member of the Whig Party. He'd hoped to be appointed to the Custom House in Philadelphia with help from President Tyler's son, Robert, an acquaintance of Poe's friend, Frederick Thomas. Poe failed to show up for a meeting with Thomas to discuss the appointment in mid-September 1842, claiming to have been sick, though Thomas believed that he had been drunk. Though he was promised an appointment, all positions were filled by others. One evening in January 1842, Virginia showed the first signs of consumption, now known as tuberculosis, while singing and playing the piano. Poe described it as breaking a blood vessel in her throat. She only partially recovered. Poe began to drink more heavily under the stress of Virginia's illness. He left Graham's and attempted to find a new position, for a time angling for a government post. He returned to New York, where he worked briefly at the Evening Mirror before becoming editor of the Broadway Journal and later sole owner. There he alienated himself from other writers by publicly accusing Henry Wadsworth Longfellow of plagiarism, though Longfellow never responded. On January 29, 1845, his poem, The Raven, appeared in the Evening Mirror and became a popular sensation. It made Poe a household name almost instantly, though he was paid only $9 for its publication. It was concurrently published in the American Review, a Whig journal under the pseudonym Quarles. The Broadway Journal failed in 1846 and Poe moved to a cottage in Fordham, New York, in what is now the Bronx. That home is known today as the Poe Cottage on the southeast corner of the Grand Concourse and Knightsbridge Road, where he befriended the Jesuits at St. John's College nearby, now Fordham University. Virginia died there on January 30th, 1847. Biographers and critics often suggest that Poe's frequent theme of the death of a beautiful woman stems from the repeated loss of women throughout his life, including his wife. Poe was increasingly unstable after his wife's death. He attempted to court poet Sarah Helen Whitman, who lived in Providence, Rhode Island. Their engagement failed, purportedly because of Poe's drinking and erratic behavior. There is also strong evidence that Whitman's mother intervened and did much to derail their relationship. 
Poe then returned to Richmond and resumed a relationship with his childhood sweetheart, Sarah Elmira Royster.